Uh, we've been in a, in a message series titled this, Either or a Vision Beyond Being Jesus' Secret Admirer. And I'm going to hit us. We always have a big idea for our series, so I want to hit us with a, our big idea once again. I always love to lo- lead with that. That'll be up on the screen for us. It says this. It says, in order for Jesus is Lord to be a lived reality, it requires a close, honest, objective, and ongoing examination of what it personally costs to be a follower of Jesus. We began this series with a simple question. Are you a follower of Jesus, right? Uh, and for many of us who maybe have been in church and uh, been following Jesus for a while, it's like, yes. But I love this series because it, it's, it's allowing us to have a pause for a second. And be like, man, have I just gotten into kind of a religious mode of following Jesus? Or like, where is my relationship with Jesus at? And what does Jesus actually say about following him, right? What, on on Jesus' terms, what does that look like? And does that change our response? And we've been playing with this idea of a vision beyond being Jesus' secret admirer. And I love this definition of a secret admirer. It'll be up on the screen as well. A secret admirer is an individual who feels adoration, fondness, or love for another person without disclosing their identity to that person and who might send gifts or love letters to their crush, right? It's so funny because we're like, oh, that's just like middle school kind of stuff, right? But for us, like in our spirituality, we can so easily slip into this mindset when it comes to following Jesus, right? A secret admirer, the type of faith where, we've been saying this, close enough where we receive the benefits of association, but far enough to not have anything required of ourselves. I titled this message, we're, gonna, we're in week five of this, this message series, and I titled uh, this morning's message uh, this, it'll be up on the screen for us, simply this, don't get churchy, don't get churchy, all right, yeah, come on, come on, wow, wow. All right, come on. We're going to do this this morning. Don't get churchy. Where's this going? Okay, I want to start us off with this. Here's what I know. Life is filled with a bunch of like really uh, interesting kind of tensions or what would I say is like complex tensions, right? Like uh, one thing that I've been thinking about a lot in this season uh, is like uh, family life and work life, right? Like that's a complex tension. And the thing that, that happens with complex tensions many times is like, Man, you can lean one, one way or you can really get into something and then kind of miss the target altogether. For instance, with, with, with family life and work life, like this for me in this season has been really practical, right? It's like, man, like I, there's so many things to do. Like I literally like the past few weeks, I'm like, I was telling somebody this out, out front this morning. It's like, I just, I'm okay. I just got to be okay right now. Just drop some balls. Things, there's certain things that just aren't going to get done because I just don't want to go home, you know what I mean, after work and be a horrible husband and a terrible father, you know? And I know this. I'm doing this imperfectly right now, but this is the tension, right? It's like, what does this look like when you know you have all these massive responsibilities, but at the same time, like, you're, you're, you have other things going on in your life. There is a tension there, and it, it needs to be, we need to be intentional people when it comes to that. But this tension's interesting, right? Because, like, you can get a job to provide in the first place for your family. But then if you become a workaholic, what happens? You now are a lousy spouse and or mom slash dad. And you've missed the target altogether. I had a buddy in Bible college, uh, my roommate. I won't say his name. I won't call him out. You know what I mean? This is on the internet. Uh, but he, uh, he, he was like, I need to get like, I need to get a job like to pay for school, to help pay for school. Well, we went to the, the, the Bible college I went to, it's, it, it's in San Dimas. And so, man, straight shot down to the 57. You got Disneyland. Like, we, everybody had a Disneyland pass in Bible college. You know what I'm saying? Like, we were hitting that place up 24-7. Like, after school, boom, a couple hours, here we go. Well, he was like, hey, I think I want to work at Disneyland. You know, that seems like a cool opportunity. So what he ends up doing is he gets the night shift. Like, all the people that are, like, doing crazy stuff, cleaning the park, making it look magnificent for the next people. Like, middle of the night shift. Like, he did this whole maintenance shift. And so he would just come in, like, you know what I mean, middle of the night or whatever, like, early hours of the morning after his night shift and what did he end up doing? He ended up sleeping through class and he ended up like failing like all his classes, right? But he went into it because he's like wanted to get a job to provide for class and then he ended up losing more money because he ended up failing all of these different classes. It's this tension that we sometimes can miss the target altogether. We can so easily set out to do noble things, right? And miss the point altogether. It's kind of like a secret admirer, right? Thinking about it, okay, I got feelings for this person and a desire for a relationship. I begin doing these things for this person in secret. This person doesn't really know who I am and therefore there's no relationship. But hey, all of a sudden this game's kind of fun. You know what I mean? It becomes a game. Enter secret admirers of Jesus. 
this tension that exists of Jesus and, and what, what I'll say this morning, religious practices. Religious practices often that are designed to, man, I want to get into a closer relationship with de- Jesus. A noble thought. Man, I want to have a more no- devoted uh, lifestyle when it comes to being devoted to Jesus. But so easily we can become obsessed with the way that we're devoted through religious practices. And before we know it, we're drowning in religiosity with maybe no Jesus attached to it whatsoever. In our day and age, I think there's a word that we can kind of translate this tension um, that, we, that I used in this title um, when we become so lopsided and maybe we become dat- detached to the noble thing altogether, which is this word churchy, where we can so easily become churchy people, maybe rather than Jesus people. We're going to be looking at Matthew 23 um, which is a chapter where, like, a vision for nice Jesus just gets thrown out the window. Like, this is one of those ones, right, where it's, like, the, it, it's pretty intense. Like, Jesus really puts on his, his, his leadership and his rebuke hat around things that it doesn't seem like he's down with. Like, I'm always paying close attention when I read the Gospels of, like, the things that Jesus, like, repeats and prioritizes. But I think equally is important for us to pay attention to scathing rebukes. In fact, this chapter is filled with seven what is oftentimes called woes, right? And, and what, is a, what is a woe? Well, a woe is, for all you uh, langu- uh, language experts uh, out, out in the room today, an onomatopoeia. Anybody know this word, right? Where, yeah, come on now. Come on now. Like, I feel like I remember this word. Like, this is like the first time this word came up in like, I don't know, 15, 16 years for me or whatever, right? But uh, an onomatopoeia is a word that describes a sound by copying the sound itself, right? Like, bam or bang, or beep, right? So like, that's what, a, that's what woe is, right? It's like, whoa. Like, when Jesus says the word, it's like, whoa. Like, listen up, whoa, bomb drop. You know what I'm saying? Like, listen up, because something's coming. And it's, 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 it's followed by these scathing rebukes. Woe is because for these people, as we begin with, it, it's no longer become about God. There's a religious system that's becoming a system where gatekeepers, a select few, are the ones that are helping people be obedient to God, which seems like a noble thing on the front end, once again. But it's become this privileged system of power and oppression. So this morning, we're talking about a religious group of people that Jesus is often rebuking called the Sanhedrin. Now, a few weeks ago, in part two of our series, we talked about Nicodemus, this guy who, like, you know, Came, came to Jesus in the dark, like was like, oh, I'll be a secret admirer, like I'm keeping my posture, right? But he was a part of the Sanhedrin. But the Sanhedrin is like, it keeps coming up. It keeps coming up in different ways. So we're going to be looking again at the Sanhedrin, which is this group of 72 men. And within this group of 72 men, that were kind of these religious leaders and overseers, it was made up of two subgroups, the, 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 the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And uh, these two groups didn't get along. And Sadducees were the ones that interpreted scripture with a more kind of a liberal lens, let's say. And the Pharisees were those that maybe interpreted scripture with more of a conservative lens, right? The Sadducees were this group that served as these chief priests and elders, and they were born into the position. So it had a lot to do with family heritage. And the Pharisees, on the other end, were a part of this group that actually worked their way. Like they were all about the things that I can do for God to prove that I'm legit, right? Right? One side, family, the other side, kind of like work. And so that kind of starts us off. Up on the screen, I want to just kind of break this down of the types of secret admirers that we're kind of looking at this morning that, that hopefully you can relate to. Um, and the first one is a heritage-based secret admirer of Jesus. It'll be up on the screen there. And for a heritage-based secret admirer of Jesus, faith means honoring a religious heritage rather than surrendering your heart in relationship. So we can say for, the, for a heritage-based secret admirer of Jesus, this is where liturgy or tradition becomes Lord. It becomes everything. It's like, well, my family did this. It's like, I grew up in a family. Like, this is it. It's like, this is why I do it. This is the motivation. But it's actually void of relationship with Jesus. So this would represent uh, the Sadducees in this case, right? And then you have the Pharisees, which is this other part of the Sanhedrin, right? Which up on the screen here. And what we're talking about here is the works-based secret admirer of Jesus. This is where faith means intellectual knowledge and behavioral compliance is actually a replacement for relational obedience. And I like this is 
the idea of this is assimilation is Lord. You know, it's like, it's like becoming the same, like having the same knowledge, like being pushed into like a cookie cutter kind of a vision for what it means to actually be obedient to Jesus. You gotta assimilate to the system. You gotta behave, you gotta look the same. And it's interesting because we look at these two types of kind of secret admirers in this case. Um, Jesus has a favorite word that he loves to use in this section of scripture. And it's a word probably many of us are familiar with. It's the word hypocrite. This is what he calls them. Eight times, right to their faces, right? He doesn't pull any punches. It's interesting when you look at the word hypocrite, where it comes from, it actually comes from Greek theater, which was very popular during this time. And oftentimes, Greek actors would oftentimes uh, be called hypocrites because there would be one actor actually playing a, like multiple roles on stage where they would literally switch masks and act different characters. So just imagine like a play, like a popular play, where it's just one actor where the guy, one person is just doing the whole thing. Just it's switching masks, like going back and forth. And this is literally the context of where this word hypocrite came from. It was like, yeah, those are hypocrites because they play in front of a stage and they change masks and they look differently and they play different characters for entertainment purposes. But I love what Matthew, in Matthew 23, what, what Jesus uses, the language Jesus uses in the New Living Translation to kind of describe this type of people as he's giving these scathing rebukes. Matthew 23, 5 says, everything they do is for show. It's for show. The hypocrite, right? The putting the masks on, the performance and this is the thing. I don't know about you, but I feel like I've been in the church long enough where churchy people, man, we got some Oscar-winning performances up in the house. Right? You're like, dang, you should have pursued a different career based on the way that you behave in a spiritual environment. This should sound very familiar to us. Because the temptation exists for each and every one of us to go in with a noble intention to follow Jesus and then to get caught up in a system that begins to oppress people within a family that God desires and loves so much. Let's begin with Matthew 23, how Jesus kind of kicks this section of scripture off. And he begins with this, it'll be up on the screen. It says, then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law And the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. It's like, yeah, you know, if you're a part of the Sanhedrin, listen to this. You're like, that's what I thought, you know. We got Jesus, this prophet, he's on our side. That's that's where it just ends, right? Like, that's where the familiarity ends. Then it says this. Jesus goes, but do not do what they do. For they do not practice what they preach. Their practices, see, weren't a reflection of who they were claiming to be as followers of God, as religious leaders. You know, it kind of makes me think these secret admirers were the ones that, that Jesus really had a problem with as we read this section of scripture. Kind of much like those that maybe, uh, you know, go to a restaurant and pray just in case somebody's watching. Or maybe those who, uh, you know, talk about how they don't watch certain shows or movies, but those same sh- shows and movies are saved on their cloud DVR at home. Maybe, maybe those that uh, help the needy and then insert it forcefully into every conversation for the next few weeks afterwards. Or maybe those who make sure people see them put their envelope into the offering box every week but don't bother reaching out to a neighbor who's suffering and can't pay their own bills. Maybe those who enjoy seeing other people fail because it makes them look better. Maybe those who raise their children on the basis of what other people think. Maybe those that are hearing this and are assuming I'm not talking about, I'm talking about someone other than you. <laughs> right? Those that maybe have been wearing the mask for so long that they're fooling themselves. Literally fooling themselves. It's interesting because like this section of scripture, like Jesus is just going, he's going hard with the woes. He's going hard with the onomatopoeia, right? And like, ironically, in other parts of the gospel, we see this equally energized posture of tenderness, right? Tenderness for those who have given their hearts to him. And actually, they don't have it all together on the outside. 
So there's this energy that's devoted to the woes of confrontation here. But we see this. We see Jesus behaving in such a way throughout the Gospels with just as much energy and fervor towards tenderness. Towards those that are on the outside, they don't have it all together. And I love this. This will be up on the screen. I think this is a huge piece of the heart of God as we're looking at this section of Scripture is that Jesus himself prioritizes authenticity over perfection. I love that that's the posture of our God. It's not prioritizing us to be perfect, robotic type of people, but it's encouraging us to be authentic people. In commune with our humanity, in communion with our brokenness, understanding what that means when we come before a loving God who receives us and accepts us and promises, even as we sang these words during our time of musical worship, he puts us back together. He literally does. So what is hypocrisy? <laughs> it's this act of pretending, right? Uh, our seven-year-old, Luca, he is like in like pretend mode these days. Um, like this is his thing. Like, I, like we were like writing like for his new teacher in school. Like, what, tell us a little bit about Luca. I was telling Kyle, I was like, you need to put down like this kid has like the, the craziest imagination. Like his creativity, it's, it's, it's insane. So he, like this is his thing, like, and he's done this for several years. Like, it's like, hey, we're going to put, we're going to change the house or the backyard or whatever into a zoo. And I'm going to make you come to my zoo. And you're going to enjoy it. And I'm going to play every animal, right? Like, it's just like literally, like we're talking about like that, that Greek theater thing. Like, this is Luca. He's like, I'm going to take you to my zoo. He's like, hey, you know what? Like one day, like he's like, you know what? We're going to change, transform our house into a movie theater. We're not just going to have a movie time, but we're going to make it dark. Like, you know what I mean? I'm up like taping areas of the house that aren't, don't have blinds. You know what I mean? Like risking my life to make it very movie theater-esque. And then like, you know, more recently, it's like, we're going to transform this whole place into Jurassic Park, dad. You know what I mean? And I'm going to play every dinosaur, right? And then even yesterday, like the thing was, I got home and it was like, dad, the house is Disneyland, Right? And like, then we sit in front of the TV and then on YouTube, you watch the, the POV view of all the rides, right? So we're riding Pirates of the Caribbean and, you know, Ledger, our, our two-year-old, he's on the little, this little thing that Luke is like shaking and making it feel like he's on the ride. And I'm like, that's, that's so fun to play pretend, right? It's so fun. But, but it's, it's more concerning when you begin to professionalize the pretend, right? It's like that, that fits within its own space. But, but what happens when this becomes a part of like adult culture and behavior that begins to infiltrate the church? <laughs> and here's what I'll say is the truth. For those of you who maybe have played this game for a long time, let me tell you that the Holy Spirit and the gift of discernment can sniff this Oscar-worthy performance out every time. But it's exhausting, right? This is exhausting. This is an exhausting way to live. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, th I think there's like this, this like uh, viewpoint that like, oh yeah, I'm getting away with this. You know what I mean? And for me, I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm just like, oh, I see what you're doing. Uh, you're doing the thing my seven-year-old does. That's cool. That's cute, right? But this is the thing within the body of Christ. The gifts of the Holy Spirit allow us to discern and to be like, hey, like that's, that's not the thing we're doing here. We're not playing pretend. We're not putting masks on, Right? And Jesus continues in Matthew 23, verse 27. We're going to skip around a little bit. We're not going to get to all the woes. Just kind of hit the highlights here. But Jesus says this in verse 27 of Matthew 26. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. There he is. He's using that word. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, you, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. And it's just so interesting because once again, we, we see this contrast of, of priority that Jesus uses throughout the Gospels, which is this priority on the inside before any of the outside behavior. And he's confronting the other way around, right? He's confronting this idea for people that prioritize the outside, but inside they're really, really crummy people. They haven't dealt with the things. And, and for Jesus, it's just always this flow from the inside out that our behaviors begin to follow the deep work of what God does on the inside, that transformative work that no one else has access to to perform soul surgery in our lives other than Jesus himself as Lord of the universe. Matthew 23, 13. Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! 
You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. This verse is the verse that haunts me, I think, in it, more than any other verse in the Bible. Because the, I'm the person who's always like, okay, like, how does free will work? And you know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? God is sovereign. There's this, once again, a complex tension. But it's interesting within this rebuke, G- Jesus is basically like, no, no, like, you can shut the door of the kingdom. Like, you literally can shut the door on people's faces from accessing my goodness and my glory because of your behavior, because of your own wickedness, because of your own problems. You literally are becoming an obstacle for other people to see Jesus. He's like, you're not getting in, but the, the, the sad part about it is, is equally you're, you're creating a, a block for others to, to have access as well. But this is interesting because these religious leaders often like got into the game of making obedience become really, really difficult. Like the gatekeepers of like, okay, this is how you're going to be obedient to, to God, right? E- even for the Pharisees, like calling out the Pharisees a little bit, like those guys made honoring the Sabbath really, really difficult. Now, Sabbath is one of these things that we've talked about, like this day off that God provides for rest. But like they got down to the details of like, you couldn't take a bath on Sabbath, any bath people? You know what I mean? When you think about rest, you're like, I'm going to throw a bath bomb in the bathtub. And these guys are like, nope, can't do that. Sorry. You know what I mean? You couldn't move furniture on the Sabbath. I don't know about you, but on the Sabbath, like when I'm taking a day off, I'm moving the ottoman to where my feet get comfortable so I can sit down and watch a movie or a show. You know what I'm saying? Like they begin to make this obedience thing so difficult and it's like, what's the point of the Sabbath? And we've talked about this before. Sabbath looks different for everybody. But then the name of game of assimilation is like, this is, no, this is how you do it. This is the right way to do it. And they turned obedience to God, this noble thing, into this game and this position of power that ended up being so destructive. True obedience, it flows from the inside out. Submission to God flows from relationship, not rules. We see Jesus making this a priority throughout his ministry, right? But it reminds me, like, rules are a thing, right? It reminds me, like, some, some rules to marriage, right? Thinking about my marriage, the big commit- commitments that I made at the altar. Let me name a few of them. Being faithful to her as we both shall live. It's good. It's great. Providing for my wife, Callie, to meet her needs. Protecting her life with my life. For better or for worse, in sickness and in health. But here's what you learn if you're married for a long time. Those are just the baseline rules. Because I learned quickly there are some other crucial guidelines. Let me give you a few. Uh, no loud or obnoxious singing before 10 a.m. Come on. All right? None. Don't even think about it. And then you try to, you, you try to just flirt with that water and then, psst, you know, ah! It gets burned every time. If you want dessert, order your own! Sharing is out of the question. Yeah, you're right. It's reasonable. Just didn't know. Didn't know. If I'm talking to you, stop looking at your phone and smiling while you're doing it. It's reasonable. I, you know, I, sometimes I like view myself on the other end of that. I'm like, okay, I see how that could be a problem, right? How about this one? This is good. On Sundays, you don't just get a break from being dad. Parenting isn't a solo job. Come on. Come on, somebody. This is a joint effort. This is a mutual submission. But here's the thing. If I viewed these as rigid and unreasonable rules, my life would be miserable. We would have tons and tons of marital problems. Am I not perfect at this? Of course I'm not perfect at this. But the, the reality is if I viewed these as things like, man, who does my wife think she is? Not able to sing 10 a.m. before 10 a.m., giving a joyful noise to the Lord, right? But these are ways that I can actually serve and honor my wife by recognizing that satisfaction comes when I sacrificially serve her in these, we- these ways. There's a richness to relationship when that motivation comes from the inside and, and, and then begins to affect the behaviors, right? When a relationship is on the inside is right, the rest will follow. It's not the other way around. Because there's something more important than the letter of the law, right? There's a person on the other side of any rule, of any regulation, 
of any guideline. And Jesus is constantly prioritizing us as his people, his children, and the ways that religious and abusive systems can just ruin it when it comes to knowing him and having a relationship with him. Jesus healed on the Sabbath one time, and the Pharisees were upset. Matthew 23, 4 in this chapter, I'm jumping around a little bit, but verse 4, it says, they tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them, right? I love this. I heard this one time that the key word for guilt is do, but the key word for grace is done. And, and, and for, the, for the religious gatekeepers during this time, there's a lot of guilt built into the motivation. When Jesus was like, no, wait a second, this is done. I love that. As, as Isaac even was leading us in worship earlier, talking about, I believe that was prophetic when he was just sharing, like there's nothing we have to do to earn. Like sitting down right now in this moment where we're giving God glory for him is enough. It can become a part of our worship. It doesn't need to be about a specific behavior, right? See, a, a secret admirer, here's what I love about the idea of a secret admirer too. It just doesn't last forever, right? Like the cat's gonna come out of the bag at some point, however this goes down. But literally when you think about it, it's because this is an exhausting way to live. It's funny to think about like middle school behaviors or whatever, like oh, a secret admirer and then it's, you know, it gets found out. Like nobody sustains it because it's exhausting. It's an impossible way to sustain a living. I mean, here's the deal, like, graduating from Bible college, I know a lot of pastors who pursued churchy, who are not in ministry anymore. It's sad. I, I got a lot of friends who went after the churchy thing, and they're no longer followers of Jesus. And it's heartbreaking for me, because I just feel like, in the grand scheme of things, is this idea of like, man... Like Jesus, the true Jesus, the Jesus that I know, like you missed him because his yoke is easy. His burden is light. There's no sustaining lifestyle that says you have to do X, Y, Z and exhaust yourselves and play some sort of a game when Jesus is constantly prioritizing us to just be authentic people that lay our lives down, that he's constantly prioritizing around this, over this idea of perfection. Matthew 23, 23 through 24, we'll, we'll end on this section here. Jesus says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. We're getting, we're getting to get really familiar with this phrase, <laughs> this chapter. It says, you give a tenth of your spices, your mint, your dill, your cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter, without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Big, de big deal on the details, right? But just, just missing the big picture. Missing the point straight into a lifestyle of what we would call churchiness, right? I love what, uh, is a quote from, from Kyle Eidelman in his book, Not a Fan. It'll be up on the screen. He said this, he said, if Jesus were preaching this sermon today, I think he might say something like, woe to you fans, if you would be as passionate about feeding the poor as you are your church's style of worship, then world hunger would end this week. Woe to you fans, if you sacrifice as much to care for the homeless and hungry in the community as you do for your church building or place of worship, the need would be wiped out. Woe to you fans if you would be as zealous about caring for the sick as you are about a Christmas tree being called a holiday tree. Health insurance wouldn't be a problem. Yikes, right? But it gets to the heart and the reality of us even as a community of faith of going, yeah, what, what are we growing into? Not only as individuals, but as a faith community, right? And I, and I think with this, we, we have a choice here. Like Matthew 23 in mind, it's like, oof, once again, if I could take the eraser to this, you know, like, I probably would on my own terms. But, but Jesus, as he begins to highlight things that can exist and do exist within our own hearts, I just believe we have a choice. Do we want to grow people in church? Or do we want to grow people 
in Jesus, in Christ. Because it begins with Jesus. And Jesus has a mission. And his mission has a church. Right? It doesn't begin with church. It doesn't begin with, well, this is what we do. This is how we behave, so become like us. It actually begins with a Savior who acknowledges us as unique, called individuals that make up this collective, that when we actually are catalyzed on mission, his church becomes a force to be reckoned with. Problems begin to be solved in our communities. So rather than it all being about, man, how do we assimilate people into a space, it becomes, no, how do we honor the uniqueness that's filled up in this room, the gifts, the passion, the stories, and how do we catalyze that to be a church that does not exist within four walls? Now, are we going to leverage the four walls? Are we going to leverage the assets we have? Are we thankful that we have a place to gather each and every week for just different reasons and things? Absolutely. But we can so easily begin to prioritize something other than the reason we got into this in the first place. Jesus is calling us, right? Will we grow as people on the outside? Or will we grow as people on the inside? Would we grow as being churchy or grow as being people that are authentically transformed by a real God who meets us and wants to even meet us right here in this place, in this moment? So we're going to end here, and this is the kind of the moment during our gathering where we, every week, we just, we take a moment of reflection. There'll be a couple questions that'll pop up on the screen here. We just look at this every week. Okay, God, like, God, what are you doing to me? What are you doing right now? Like, uh, to me, like, this is one of the most important things of what we do every week, to be honest. Because it's just like, okay, we can dump a bunch of data on everybody, but, like, transformation happens when we're like, okay, God, I'm going to believe and have faith that you're speaking through this moment, and there's something that you want to do and encourage me to do, maybe this week, maybe today, maybe in the next few hours, right? So those two questions, what is the Spirit prompting you with today, and what are you going to do about it? And oftentimes we, we talk about journaling I will statements, not a diary for all you guys out there are like, it sounds like a diary, right? Just talking about what does it look like to jot the things that God is calling you to? And, and you have a reference point to look back. Man, I'll, I'll say this. There's, there's been a rhythm of me in this season. Going back to my I will statements and being like, dang it. You know what I mean? Like, I missed it. And realizing that God spoke the same thing to me six months ago. But this boneheaded guy didn't want to listen at that moment or for whatever reason, Right? For us just to begin to take, uh, t- t- take residence of what God is calling us to and being obedient to the very thing. I love it because all of our steps are going to look different. But giving ourselves space to reflect in this moment as a church family and kind of discern for ourselves what is God speaking. I love that definition of a disciple. It's really simple. One who hears and obeys the voice of Jesus. So let's do that. Let's spend the next several minutes hearing and obeying. Let me pray us in, and then we'll just spend the next few minutes just taking that, taking these moments, discerning that for ourselves, and then the worship team will will lead us after, after several minutes of just reflection. But let's pray. Lord, we do. We want to be people that...